This is where you take that clapper. Yeah, like, take two, Daryl Haley. Clap, take two. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, ladies, and welcome back to another Lunch and Learn. Uh, whether you are joining us on Facebook or live here in the audience, we are glad that you are with us. But um, to be honest and upfront with you, um, we had a little snafu. So we are, this is our second take around and um, we felt it was important to bring you this information. So we are just taking a take two. I'm Leanne Dilley with the Women's Ministry and I'm glad you're here. We are here with Pastor Daryl Haley, uh, who is the head pastor for our volunteers here at Timberline. Um, and Pastor Daryl, thank you, first of all, for being with us. And could you tell us a little bit about your position and how long you've been here and what that is and what's involved with that? Yeah, thank you, Leanne. Mm -hmm. and, and thank you. Thank you, ladies, for having me uh, join you today. I've been looking forward to this. And I actually got a free lunch out of it just before we <laughs> began the video recording, too. So it's really been a good start so far. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I have been full-time on staff here at Timberline for this June will be 25 years. The first 10 years uh, that I was here was as children's pastor. Great 10 years. Along the way, uh, Pastor Derry uh, had discovered that we need a better process, a system, a way to get volunteers involved in every area of ministry here in Timberline. So he asked me if I would transition from children's to to help Timberline do just that, to help people find their uh, best place, their best way to serve in ministry. So that's what I do now. I help people find uh, their their spot and their way to serve the Lord, both on the campus, uh, across the street, and around the world. Awesome. Awesome. We all need a little help and a little push at times, so that's great. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your um, what you did before ministry? Yeah. Um, before I went into ministry, vocationally, I was working as an underground coal miner in just outside of Palisade, Colorado, which is near Grand Junction. And when I started working there, I did not know the Lord. In fact, I was very, very far from the Lord. I was raised in a home that um, wasn't the most functional. In fact, you could say that I lived in a dysfunctional home. It was not a godly home. Um, I dropped out of high school uh, before um, I was uh, 17 years old, and I just started to kind of wander around through life uh, aimlessly, without much purpose, making bad choices, and it caused a lot of problems um, for, for me and for others around me. But in my journey to uh, just try to figure out where I was going and who I was to be, I met a wonderful woman. Her name is Dion. She's now my wife. She was the first best thing to happen to me in this journey of trying to find purpose and trying to find direction in life. So life got much better after I met and married Dion. Then we had a daughter and life got even better. So for a few years after our daughter Jessica was born, life was good. I was doing a fairly good job of being a good husband. I was doing a fairly good job of being a good dad. But my bad choices started to um, to take over again. My poor decisions, um, selfish, uh, selfish ambitions, self-centered uh, actions. And I didn't know Jesus. I uh, had no idea who he was other than a cuss word. So I found myself in a pretty desperate situation. And then our son was born. And when our son Dustin was born, that was the tipping point for me. That's when I knew that, that I couldn't fix myself. I couldn't, I couldn't make myself to become the person that I wanted to and needed to be, so I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. I went to a church in Grand Junction and went forward at an altar of salvation, and I asked to be forgiven, and he did, and Jesus forgave me. And the, one of the fascinating things about that particular experience was the church that I was um, attending had this very tall, handsome youth pastor with a big, long, blonde mullet. And his name was Derry Northrup. Yes, that's right. Pastor Derry Northrup had one of the most impressive mullets that you would ever see in your life. As a young man, he, he really carried that mullet well. So from that point forward, my wife Dion and I 
our daughter and our son, we began a new, we began a new journey. And this journey was a journey with Jesus. Turned our lives right side up, and God has been good, and God has been great every step of the way. So that Sunday morning, after we came home from church, that Sunday morning that I had uh, gone forward and uh, accepted Christ, I came home and I threw away all the bad stuff that was in my house. The alley behind our house had uh, trash cans and I just proceeded to go out there with uh, all my rock and roll record albums and other things that were inappropriate to have in my home and I threw them all away in the trash. And it, it was a good thing. It was just, I knew it was the right thing to do, but I would have to say that today, there are a few of those records I wished I would have kept. I am a little sorry that I threw some of them away, but at the time it was the right thing to do. Uh, it, it feels like it, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm feeling your vibe, but I'm wondering what regret you might have. <laughs> well, I threw away... Be specific. <laughs> yes, I threw away a Pink Floyd album, Dark Side of the Moon, that I really liked a lot, you know, and... Um, but the, the, thing with, the thing with those records is that at that time, they really influenced and fueled uh, my bad behaviors and bad decisions, and so that's why I felt like they needed to go. Yeah. But today, those wouldn't even be an issue for me. I love Pink Floyd. I love to listen to some of those old songs and, and today, and it doesn't, it doesn't bother me at all. I was wondering, did you feel like it was a long process, or like was there immediate things that happened in your, in your transformation? Yeah, I think now some of that I think we talk about a little bit later in, in the interview. I think we talked about some of that. Um, yeah, my, my transformation was, was instantaneous as far as the temptations, as far as the, um, the, the, uh, the temptation to make bad choices, to abuse drugs and to abuse alcohol, uh, it removed instantly. All of that was taken away immediately. But it was a process. It was a process to become um, confident and to become really capable in walking faithfully with Jesus. But it wasn't because I was tempted anymore. It's just because I was ignorant. I really didn't know what it meant to follow the Lord. But attending church, uh, going to classes, reading my Bible, uh, all of that began to uh, it began to to, to click. And then Dion and I just began to, to look for ways where, where we could serve. Um, we were obedient when we were asked to be involved, and we did the best we could with what we were given to do. And one thing led to another. We found ourselves working full-time vocationally in ministry. Awesome. I want to thank you for exposing some vulnerability there and sharing your past with us, because I think so often um, <clears throat> we see you as pastors in um and we just think that you've always had it together, but there is, it's so important to understand that there's always a, trans, a transformation piece yeah. and that it's Jesus's work that yeah. changes us. Yeah. Well, I'm just so grateful. The Lord not only saved me, but he saved, he saved my family as well. He saved Dion and our daughter, Jessica, and our son, Dustin. And we, we've had an amazing life. Dion and I have been married for 42 years and, and it's been great, but none of that would have happened. If it wouldn't have been for Christ, I, I would. I don't think I would have. I wouldn't probably wouldn't have lived. And so, we'll always be eternally grateful for the Lord. Very good. Okay, so Pastor Daryl, you've just explained your salvation story to us. Um, can you tell us about the moment that you really started to think about ministry? Mm. Wow, that's a great question. Um, let's let's call it the call. Like I don't journey, know what else to really. The journey or whatever. Yeah, I don't know what else to really call it, other than the call. Honestly, I think it was from the very first day that we came to Christ. But more specifically, it was about a month after we had uh, started going to church. Um, we started to get involved, you know, with the the community and the culture of the church. And I remember um, a big tall fellow, not Pastor Derry, another big tall fellow that did not have a mullet. His name is Ken Porter, 
And Ken was the Sunday school superintendent, and he approached Dion and I, and he asked if we would become assistant first grade Sunday school teachers. And it petrified me. <laughs> Just the idea that, that we would be responsible with a spiritual direction and formation of other people. Um, and I was really afraid the first graders would know a whole lot more than I knew, <laughs> which turned out to be true. <laughs> so, but we accepted the positions. But what was kind of fun about it was my wife, Dion, she had the job of, of tearing apart the, uh, the, the, uh, the pull-out characters for the flannel board. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she would break out the little flannel characters. That was her job. And then my job was to hand out the fish crackers for class. <laughs> so it, we were a, we were a, a fit. We were, perfect, we were a perfect fit for it because Dion got to do her, you know, her her thing. She likes to do, you know, tactile things like that, and I just love handing out fish crackers. So it worked out great. <laughs> so that was our first assignment. And um, but what was really powerful, seriously, what was really powerful about that was we had to learn the Bible stories. Mm -hmm. Even though we're just assistant teachers, we still had to know something. I didn't know the difference between, honestly, between Jonah and Noah. I I really didn't know. Um, I knew a little bit about Goliath for some reason, but that was it. So we had to learn these stories, and we had to dig into the scriptures and, and, and figure stuff out. And it was really powerful, really good. It helped us grow. And then about uh, a year later, Pastor Derry, he approached me, and he had a, a teacher's manual, and he asked me if I would do the last three classes for the summer uh, high school group, because his intern that had been here from Central Bible College was headed back to school. That really terrified me. The idea of having to teach high schoolers something about God and about Scripture. So I dug in and I studied and I studied. I said yes, of course. Dug in and studied and studied. And I was so prepared. I had all these books and all these resources. And I showed up to the high school class that first day ready to impress them and, and, and show them all this wonderful Bible knowledge. And turns out all they wanted to do was have a pillow fight. <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was great. Oh, so that's gosh. kind of what started it. But I, really, the, probably the best way to answer that question, Leanne, is Dion and I have always just said yes. Mm -hmm. We've just always said yes. Mm -hmm. Sure so sign many, of the Spirit. <laughs> yeah, Daryl, hey, would you do this? Or Daryl, would you do that? And we always say yes. Now, there were a few times along the way we probably shouldn't have. <laughs> it turned out that that really wasn't what we were called to or what we were really wired for. But we found out because we tried it. Uh -huh. So that's really the whole the whole story. Is we just kept saying yes till eventually there was an opportunity to go to work full time for a church uh, at the same church in Grand Junction to go to work for them, and uh, we said yes, and here we are. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now, speaking of Dion, why don't you? Would you guys all like to know the romance story? And yeah, we <laughs> usually like to hear something like that. Yeah. <laughs> How'd you meet? You know that kind of thing. I'm trying to think. There were three things that Dion told me not to say. <laughs> She's not here. I don't remember what they are now. I don't remember. She, she told me. <laughs> um, so I met Dion. A friend of mine and I. Uh, we were fellow uh, coal miners, and we were driving around on a Saturday in his uh, his black uh, Corvette Stingray. Had the T-tops down, we we're driving around the park, and we saw these two really cute girls, and we pulled over, and we just thought we'd impress them with his, my friend's car, and then maybe we could, you know, uh, go on a date or something. And it worked. <laughs> it actually worked. So, so Dion and I, we went on a date. And back in those days, they had they had these things called discos. <laughs> and you would go to the disco, and, and you would you'd wear corduroy pants and and wear a corduroy vest. And, and they had a ball that would spin in the middle of the room, and you would dance, you know, to John Travolta song. Not well, not John Travolta song, BG songs mm -hmm. that John Travolta made famous. <laughs> there, let me get that right. So that was our first date. Um, I, I fell in love with her straight away. One thing that was also very compelling, Dion was raised in a very solid uh, home, a, a farming family. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't overly religious, but uh, other than they were hard, hard workers, very, very uh, moral. And um, Dion's mom was an amazing cook. She, Dion has four brothers, and then plus Dion's dad. So Dion's mom did a lot of really good cooking. So 
we had been dating for maybe a couple weeks, and they invited me over for dinner, and there was no getting rid of me after that. <laughs> that was, so a week was all in. stomach, really. Or I, was, I was all in. And then, um, oh, about a year later, we were married. And um, then they, uh, we moved um, to Denver for a while because the mine that I was working at had closed. I went back to school. Uh, and then from there, just started to pursue other kinds of career opportunities. And uh, Dion's always been there to support uh, support me the whole the whole time. Yeah, nice, nice little story. <laughs> Any other questions out there about that? <laughs> yeah. How long have they been married? Oh. How long have you been married? If you've been uh, <laughs> 40, 43 years. And two kids? Mm -hmm. No grandkids yet, though. <sighs> Unfortunately, okay. we're impatiently waiting for grandkids. <laughs> yes, but we have two great children. Our daughter Jessica, she lives in Loveland. She's 42. Our son Dustin's 37. He lives down in Denver with his wife Karen, and they're doing great. They're they're they're, they're walking with the Lord. Uh, they have good careers and they're good people. Yeah, yeah. So, yes. So when you were coming out of the dregs of the drugs and alcohol, were your kids aware of that? I mean, what kind of ages were they? Great question, Joyce, thank you. That's probably one of the one of the most beautiful parts of the story is that our daughter was five at the time. And um, one of the reasons that I actually wound up going to church is because my friend Billy Joe was telling me about these great kids programs that they had at the church. So I actually took my daughter to church first because I wanted her to, I wanted her to, um, I wanted to make sure she was gonna go to heaven. I wanted to make sure my daughter was going to go to heaven. So I took her to church, and the people that were really nice to her, I, I was kind of disappointed they were so nice because I thought maybe that they might be, you know, uh, kind of ornery and mean, and I have reason not to like them. But uh, they were great, wonderful people. So then we started going to church because our daughter was going. And our son, was he was an infant. In fact, I marked my salvation by the birth of our son. Because when he was born, that was the final tipping point for me to, to walk away from or to, to try to get away from um, a life of sin and brokenness. So our kids were five and, and newborn. And the thing that I'm so grateful for is that neither one of our kids have had to grow up in a home that was just, you know, broken and sin-filled. A normal home um, with a weird dad and a wonderful mom. But... Um, <laughs> Nevertheless, they, uh, they, they don't look back on their lives with a bunch of scars because their family was, um, was broken and sinful. Thanks. Thank you. Great question. Yeah. So um, I'm just curious as you're sitting here talking to them, because your personality is such that, um, you know, it's kind of out there. It's joyful. It's um, accepting, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm just wondering if there's a person in your life, because you talked about your rough childhood, you know, if there's a person in your life that you can attribute kind of those personality traits, if you will, to? Yeah, great, great question. Um, my mom was actually very uh, outgoing, um, lively spirit, maybe, and some, sometimes maybe too lively, too outgoing. But I think probably most of my character would probably come from her personality. And then there have been some people along the way, too, that have influenced me greatly. Mostly folks that um, I look back since uh, we've become believers. There have been people in my life that have really influenced me and helped me. And quite honestly, Derry Northrup has been one of them. He's really been a big influence on my life over the years. And I, I look to him not only as my pastor, but also as a friend as well. Yeah. And so I'll, I would have to confess, I do try to kind of, I try to, be like dairy as much as I can. <laughs> don't, don't tell him I said that. <laughs> we won't tell that. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I guess I would like to know, unless somebody else has another question, um, what you like to do for fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, about 10 years ago, um, I started riding a motorcycle. Oh, boy. And um, <laughs> that really, it's very... It's, it's exciting, uh, it's fulfilling, it's adventurous. But the thing that I found about riding, it's a street bike, uh, ride a Harley. And what I found that's really restorative about it is that when I'm riding a motorcycle, I'm not thinking about my phone, 
I'm not thinking about the next thing I have to do or my next appointment. I'm just thinking about staying alive. <laughs> I just, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to keep what they call the shiny side up. Yeah. You know, I'm just, <laughs> that's, what, that's what I'm doing. I'm not distracted, you know, by, by life. I'm just enjoying this moment. And then Dion started to ride with me a few years ago, so we do trips. Um, and so that's, that's a lot of fun. Now, you can't do a lot of that in the, the wintertime. So it's, it's a fair weather sport, sure. if you will. So it turns out what we really like to do now, don't tell anybody, what we really like to do now is we binge on Netflix. Oh, <laughs> you're the only one. <laughs> During the winter months. Yeah. Especially this year. Yeah. And, yeah, especially this year. And, and I think for, I wouldn't call it a hobby, but I would definitely call it a passion and an activity, is we have two little dogs. And uh, I think, Vicki, you know our dogs. And I'm calling a few. Okay, you know our dogs. Does anybody else know our dogs? I've been to your house. Maybe. Brody, yeah, Brody and Annie. But anyway, we have these two little dogs. And since we don't have grandchildren, those little dogs, I think, it seems to me like they've sort of filled that void. Uh huh. So we, we do a lot of stuff with our dogs. I take them for a walk at least once a day. Okay. So so the dogs, motorcycle, and Netflix. That's, that's pretty much life. It. Yeah. <laughs> that's life. <laughs> pretty exciting for us too. <laughs> um, okay. So what I, I guess I'd also like to know is there something that you can identify that um, that just really brings you joy, and on this at the same time, is there something that breaks your heart? Yeah. Yeah. You were, She warned me about this question. We talked about this one yesterday. And, uh, in fact, everything we've done so far has all been completely rehearsed. <laughs> <laughs> Not completely. <laughs> no. I'm, we're, I'm teasing. But we did, we did get to meet yesterday and talk about this so she could warn me about all of you gals and, and I could be prepared. Okay. I think the number one thing that I get fulfillment from is when I get to help you become fulfilled. Oh. Since that's a good position for you to be in then. Yeah, so, when yeah. I... When I was a, a boy, a small boy, elementary school, we moved around a lot. Um, my mom was divorced a few times and remarried, so we would go to different places to live. And every time I would go to a new school, I had to um, kind of start over again, make friends. And what I noticed was that every new school, there would always be another kid kind of like me, or maybe two, that would be kind of alone. Mm -hmm. They would sit at the table by themselves or they on a playground they would be by themselves. They didn't really have anybody to play with. So I would find myself gravitating towards those kids mm. and, and then try to find a way to get them included into something else that was happening. Just try to get them involved. Part of it so I could have somebody to be involved with as well. But it just I didn't realize that was going on at the time, but I didn't realize that was a tendency until later in life, especially when I started in ministry. I recognized that what I really enjoy doing is helping people get included, and find their place to serve that makes them happy. That's a really cool story to, uh, yeah. you know, of evolution into what you're doing. Yeah, yeah I just, that's, that's what I love to do more than anything. And I guess what breaks my heart is when I see somebody that has been broken because of church. Mm -hmm. Or because of ministry, mm -hmm. that should just never happen. No, nobody should ever be hurt by the church. But you know, the church were people, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, people hurt people. Mm -hmm. So, but that's yeah, that would be yeah, it. yeah. Good answer. <laughs> Good answers. Yeah. Um, since we only have a few minutes left, I guess if, if you could talk to us a little bit about how we could pray for you. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I would say we, Dion and I are very involved in a, a mission called uh, Royal Family Kids. We serve foster kids, and some of you are, are well aware of that. Caring Canines is a part, Katie and Caring Canines have been a part of that. Um, I pray for us in this mission to, we really need some spiritual protection right now. We really need some spiritual covering. Uh, we need some spiritual uh, direction. Um, serving abused and abandoned children is, is powerful. It's very powerful, very rewarding, very dynamic, but it's also, that's a very dark place. And I didn't recognize, we started this ministry here 
uh, about seven years ago at Timberline. And at that time, I had no idea that the depth of darkness right here in our beautiful uh, community that existed. I really had no idea how much depravity there is and abuse there is with children. So let me just say pray for us as we continue to try to press in and bring light into this dark place. Yeah. Do you want to tell us, too, about kind of how that RFK got started, Royal Family Kids got started? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a nationwide organization uh, that started in Southern California about 30 years ago. And then um, in November, uh, uh, November 2014, the founder came here to speak, came to Timberline to speak at an orphan care weekend. And when he spoke, um, the, the vision was cast, and our church just said yes. Timberline said yes, we will do this. We'll do a camp. We're going to do a camp for foster kids, because that's what Royal Family Kids uh, focuses on. It's how, how things get started with a week-long overnight camp for kids 6 to 12 years old. So we started, we started uh, pulling that together, raising funds, launched the camp, and uh, we've been at it now for uh, going on seven years. Has it really grown? I mean, from where you started? Yeah, Do you remember? it's grown a lot, yeah. yeah. The first year we had uh, told between two camps, we had 61 kids that attended uh, one week of camp, and now we have, um, we have 80 kids, but we also have about 100 plus kids that are still involved year round, that more than just camp. We have a mentor program. Uh, we have kids that have graduated out of camp and they're still involved with us in the mentor program. So it's doubled in size as far as the numbers, mm -hmm. but it's also grown from one week to uh, 52 weeks. Right. So what do you attribute the growth to? Well, the answer. I was afraid of the answer. Yeah, 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 the, the answer is Jesus. That's the oh, answer. Okay, that's but, a good one. <laughs> um, but that's 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 the first answer you learn when you're in Sunday school. Everything's Jesus. The answer, the answer is always Jesus. Um, here's what I attribute it to: is this. I, I attribute to. Um, it's a very compelling um, mission, and when people see the opportunity and they sample it, they can't say no from that point. Yeah. Once you try it, you can't get out. Okay. That's a good good reason for growth, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything else you want to share with us before we say goodbye to our Facebook and YouTube friends? No, just thank you. Thank all of you. <laughs> this, is, um, this is fun. It is fun. I hope you guys are all enjoying this. Um, I'm going to sign off. We, we will be signing off now. Our next pastor up is going to be Pastor Jeff Lucas, mm -hmm. but uh, it will be May. We are going to take April off as far as lunch and learns because we are hosting a are you ready to welcome the power of the holy spirit um event and it's three thursday nights the 15th 22nd and 29th right here at timberline so we hope you as women will join us for that as we welcome the holy spirit and then we'll pick it up again with pastor jeff in may thank you, thank you. <laughs>